And this is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. A lack of pilots is not only disrupting people's vacations, but also the administration of justice. Court hearings in northern Manitoba are being delayed. And as the CBC's Ian Fraze reports, that's having serious consequences. Grounded flights are denying people their day in court. Defense lawyers like Chris Sigurdsson cannot travel to remote northern communities. Probably about half the time or more. We haven't been able to fly. We're we're told at the last minute or the evening before that there's an issue and there's some efforts that are made to get up there. And it's always a lack of a plane or lack of a pilot. The pilot shortage last summer was well documented. It wrecked vacation plans. And now in northern Manitoba, it's postponing court. It's happened to Sigurdsson around 10 times, including on Thursday. It's annoying that I can't go, but... The real issue is that the people in those communities aren't being served. The people in those communities can't have their cases heard because we're not there. He says people are left on bail for too long and victims of crime don't get closure in a timely fashion. Sigerson says some people in these communities, many indigenous, are fed up. It's already difficult enough that our system shows up in their community and tries to dispense justice. If we say we're coming and we don't, it causes difficulties. Defense attorney Caitlin Porash has been stuck in Thompson's airport trying to get to a court hearing. You know, this issue is a big one, but someone has to take responsibility for it. Um, th these are people who have families who love them and want to come home. Exchange Income Corporation, which runs carriers like Kuwaitan and Perimeter, operate these flights. The company says it's affected by the same pilot shortage impacting the big carriers. It's trying to hire more staff after some of their pilots went to work for the big carriers. In the meantime, Paras says some clients are taking their legal fate into their own hands. They're stuck in custody now, um, you know, until they can actually have their matter heard or their trial. And often clients will say, uh, you know, that's too long for me to wait. Like, what is the Crown offering on a guilty plea? And they will plead guilty and take a deal um, to just get out of custody. The Criminal Defense Lawyers Association of Manitoba wants to talk to the province about possible solutions. As for the province, it says it's working to ensure access to justice for everyone. Ian Fraze, CBC News, Winnipeg. A search for the remains of two women believed to be in a landfill north of Winnipeg could begin as early as April. The federal government has committed $500,000 to a feasibility study on a possible search, which could be completed within six weeks. Today, family said once again, this is just the beginning. They are not giving up until they find their loved ones. CBC's Brittany Greenslade has more. It's a massive area filled with garbage, where the thought of searching for the remains of Morgan Harris and Mercedes Myron has been overwhelming and frustrating for families. This shouldn't happen, right? We shouldn't have to search. But yet, for weeks, they've been pleading to do just that. From vigils to protests, they've remained steadfast, determined to bring their loved ones home. Hopefully, that we be able to find our missing and murdered Indigenous women. In, in this region. Now that hope is one step closer to being a reality. At this point in time, the study is going to happen. Our search is going to happen in this, in this region for the loved ones that we have lost. The remains of at least two women are believed to have been dumped at the landfill last May, victims of alleged serial killer Jeremy Skabicki. Now with half a million dollars from Ottawa for a feasibility study, the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs says a search of the Prairie Green landfill is just months away. It'll take four to six weeks for us to be able to, um, to, to do a final report as to what we're going to do in terms of when we're going to start. So I think it would be safe to say that probably in April that, that the work can actually really be done. The group has hired experts who've been looking at methods and technologies used in similar searches at the Picton Farm in BC, where a search there lasted 21 months. The site here will be toured and all options are being assessed. 
that's what we're looking at right now. So there was the conveyor belt method that seems to be the best way. Um, we're, look, we we're looking to go into a recycling plant that offered to help us um, to lift any metal debris out. New techniques and technology are also being looked into. We do the work the best way we can so that, that this never happens again to our people, to our women. While it's unclear how long it could take or a final cost, for them, it doesn't matter. Our women should not be ending up in landfills in this province. And the family says they will not stop until their loved ones are found. Brittany Greenslade, CBC News, Winnipeg. Manitoba's premier argues she ought to face only a small fine or no penalty at all if a court decides she did violate conflict of interest rules. A hearing is slated for Monday to determine if Premier Heather Stephenson broke provincial rules. Liberal leader Dougal Lamont took Stephenson to court after she apologized for failing to disclose three property sales she was supposed to disclose. Lamont wants Stephenson suspended if the court sides in his favor. In a new brief, Stephenson says anything more severe than a small fine would be excessive. A large penalty, she contends, could encourage rivals to use the courts for political advantage. Police are looking for a suspect in what they call a random and unprovoked machete attack in St. James. It happened near Ness and Mount Royal Road around 1.30 yesterday afternoon. Police say the victim and the suspect got off a bus at the same stop. The victim, a 50-year-old man, was hit with a machete and he needed surgery for that wound. The suspect ran away. The union representing Winnipeg bus drivers says this attack further proves the need for security staff on buses. The proposed city budget for 2023 includes $5 million for a transit security team. A Winnipeg man says he was sent home with the wrong family from the hospital when he was born 66 years ago. Now he's looking for answers and compensation after he says he missed out on knowing his birth family. CBC's Stephanie Cram has his story. This is a picture of my mom and dad, Ambrose, my bonded family I grew up with. Bonded because they aren't his biological parents. Last year, Edward Ambrose received a call from his sister. She said through a 23andMe test, she found a brother in British Columbia, born the same day as Ambrose at the same hospital. I wasn't ready for that. Uh, to me, it was, it, was, it was a shock to me. It was a hurting. Like, uh, there was like something ripped out of me, like someone pulled out a piece of me. Ambrose said at first he couldn't believe the news, that he and another child were switched at birth at a hospital in Arburg, Manitoba in 1955. That other boy, Richard Beauvais, lived a very different life. He says to me that there was times that uh, he had to go into the garbage dumps and look for food to help feed his sisters. That's pretty sad. Beauvais was raised Métis, a residential day school survivor, and taken away from his family in the 60s scoop. Ambrose is now connecting to his biological family, the Beauvais. I was very touched. I had a bit of emotion and tears for seeing them for the first time and so thinking to myself, wow, you know, like, this is, this is my family. Like, how could that be? This week, Ambrose can't help but think of his bonded dad, James Ambrose, saying if he knew what Richard had gone through, he would have adopted him. And as for his biological parents, he is learning about them from his new found sisters. Of seeing my sisters, I see mom and dad. That's the only memory I'm going to have and in, in whatever they're going to tell me about them. That's all I have. Working with the lawyer, the two men want an apology and compensation for what they went through. Their lawyer says he made that request to the province in April 2022 and received a response from its lawyer in December, saying the province had no legal liability in the situation and that it would not offer any compensation. The province has not responded to our request for a comment. Stephanie Cram, CBC News, Winnipeg. This is the third case of children being switched at birth in Manitoba that we know of. Two other sets of men from Northern First Nations found out they were switched at birth at the Norway House Indian Hospital in 1975. 
Here in Manitoba, people are devastated by the earthquake deaths in Turkey and Syria. They have now passed 22,000 as search teams work through obliterated buildings for a fifth day. <laughs> There were stunning rescues today, including nine children. But hopes of finding more survivors are fading. Millions of meals have been distributed, but many people still haven't been reached. Turkey's president today expressed sadness that the rescue effort was unable to proceed more quickly. And with tents behind him, he vowed the area will be rebuilt within a year. Now, this is a story that touches people here in Manitoba very deeply. They're trying to help people, to help get aid to those that need it in Syria and Turkey. CBC's Elena Cole brings us more. The destruction, heart-wrenching. The loss of life, now more than 21,000 people. It's been days since a 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck Syria and Turkey. He post every day. Fatima Hamzi is from Aleppo. She's been watching closely, trying to get updates from people she knows. In some cases, her family hearing the worst. My dad was so so sad, like his friend lost his two daughters and uh, uh, he was like uh, crying and like sending us, uh, please pray for us. Hamzi says she's heard a close friend die too. She says she'd like to be there to help in person, but she can't. So she's sending as much money as she can and is calling on others to help get aid to people who need it. We need people to support them, to donate for them. And it's very simple to save their life by donating support and uh, send uh, money, food. The Manitoba Islamic Association is trying. They're working with Islamic Relief Canada. Today at the Winnipeg Grand Mosque, a special fundraiser following prayers. Ruhin Aziz says they're also trying to be there for people here. Uh, being far away from your loved ones when they're facing uh, something like this uh, can have a real toll on your mental health. You're so far away, um, you're maybe not able to contact them, uh, not have get, get an update on how things are going. And so, you know, for us, I think it's important to support our neighbours, to support our brothers and sisters who are here. Hamzi says every bit of support for those in affected areas can make a difference. They don't have any shelters, they don't have any houses, they don't have any food, and they're suffering from, uh, they're already suffering from war. For now, she'll keep trying to get help to people in any way she can. Alana Cole, CBC News, Winnipeg. It's time now to check on the weather forecast for the weekend with our weather specialist, Fiona Odlum. It's Friday. We made it through the week. We did. We did. Oh, it was a long week. Even though it was it was pretty mild, it was... It certainly was. Yeah, yeah. It was a bit of a long week, but we're here now. You know, that groundhog was a little bit wrong by saying six more weeks of winter because it certainly felt like spring this week, that's for sure. Let's take a look at our current conditions where it's a little bit cooler than, than uh, yesterday. Minus seven with the wind chill. Minus 16. Okay, I want you to note the wind. That's going to be a huge player for us today. Uh, gusting from the south up 37 kilometers an hour. That's not too bad. Dauphin, I have a totally different story for you. But first of all, I want to talk about a reason to get outside tonight. We are going to see a nice clear sky in a lot of the province. And just north of Winnipeg, you have a good chance of seeing some aurora tonight. Very active stream coming through the province today and really of the bulk of the country. Actually, if we're in northern Quebec, you're just going to have the best show of your life. Right now in Winnipeg, we've got a little bit of cloud out there, but a mostly clear evening currently, which is really great. You can see that little pocket there uh, between Winnipeg Pagan Gimli, uh, that's a good zone there to try and see some aurora. Now, we are looking for this big storm that's going to be passing through the northern portion of the province, but I really want to focus on the south here, where we can see that we have this nice clearing trend here. Even though we have warm air coming in, which usually means that there's going to be a bit of cloud, we're going to see a lot of sunshine coming our way for our Saturday. We're going to also be watching for some little moments of snow. This is popping up here along the Saskatchewan border to Dauphin. It doesn't really accumulate to much, but we could potentially see a centimeter of snow towards us on Sunday. Now, what we're looking for at the long range is another storm to be passing through 
later in the week, but th the weekend, excuse me. But this is what we're looking for in terms of snowfall totals. We're looking for about a centimeter in towards the Gimli area and trace snow to Winnipeg two centimeters in towards the Kenora Dryden area. That's over the weekend. Now the wind, this is the big one. So we're gonna be watching Dauphin. Look at this, gusts tonight into the 60s, 70s zone. It's gonna be very breezy overnight tonight. But then as we move through the week, the, the morning, we're gonna be seeing that things start to fall apart and the wind dies down. Then it starts to percolate again Sunday into Monday. So a bit of a breezy weekend for you. Minus four at midnight here in Winnipeg. Wind gusting still up to about 40, partly cloudy sky, lots of sunshine to start your Saturday morning, zero degrees. We're going to be looking at lunchtime already for two degrees, and that's where we're going to stop. We're going to make that our daytime high tomorrow, and you can see a nice little northwest wind gusting to 30. So if you're planning on hitting the forks and doing the trail there, you're going to have to do a lot of the work yourself. You're not going to have the wind to propel you if you're going to be skating. Our, our three-day forecast for Sunday, that's where we do see that chance of that one centimeter of snow just drifting in from those remnant storms north. And then a mix of sun and cloud on Monday. And then, Janet, on Tuesday, that's when we start seeing our next weather event happening just in time for Valentine's. Oh, well, you know. Thanks. <laughs> we'll watch for it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. Catch up with you in just a little bit. You know, every Friday, newcomers gather in Winnipeg Central Park to take a crack at a favorite Canadian pastime, ice skating. It's part of the new Canadian skate program offered by the West End Biz. CBC community reporter Nimponde Lande dropped by earlier today. There we go. Hi, my name is Anna Simvana, and today I'm learning how to skate. Hi, my name is Charlie and I uh, teach the newcomer skate program for the West End Biz. So we'll just go over a few uh, basic pointers. And I think it's really important for people who are moving into such a cold city to learn how to skate and enjoy those different aspects of, of Winnipeg. I'm going to fall or something, but it's okay, they are great. <laughs> Pick whatever foot you feel comfortable, two hands on one knee, and up into a standing position. My first thought was like, I am afraid to fall, I am afraid to hurt myself, but right now I think uh, it's getting better. Most of the times it's the courage to actually skate that is the hardest part. My name is Amjad Haddad, I'm a newcomer here. Uh, I'm, today I'm trying to skate uh, here. It's, uh, it's amazing sport, yeah, and it's hard, <laughs> hard to do it. My name is Wajdi Haddad, we are from Syria. In Syria, we don't have a lot of uh, snow and ice. Uh, when we uh, coming to uh, Winnipeg and uh, watch on TV the match of uh, jets, yeah, uh, we like we like how to skate and it's a hard uh, uh, match. And we looking for someone who <coughs> yeah, le le teach us uh, the skating. They are great instructors. They are the best. <laughs> And a lot of them um, use these skills to take their kids skating. So a lot of them have young kids and they want to be able to, you know, go skating with their kids or go on the river at the forks with their kids. So this gives them those skills so they can, they can do that. It's coming very naturally to you, I think. <laughs> Isn't that a lovely story? Thanks uh, uh, as well to our Warren Kay, who I know edited that together, did a beautiful job. Now, if you had told me in the late 1980s that someday I'd get to interview much music super host Monica Diol, I wouldn't have believed it. I didn't know until today that Monica is a Manitoban. When her family moved to Canada from India, they settled in Beausager. She is the singer the Jets have tapped to sing the anthems before tomorrow night's game, part of their South Asian Heritage Night celebration. This afternoon, I reached Monica at her mom's house here in Winnipeg. Monica Diol, welcome home. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to be here. Why did you want to be part of the Jets South Asian Heritage Night? Um, you know, they 
they called me up and asked me if I would take part. And uh, on the West Coast, the Canucks have done uh, a Salvation Night, I think, five or six times now. And this is the very first one in Winnipeg. And uh, I really felt honored. I felt honored that they thought of me, um, that they think of me as a Winnipegger, because I am. And uh, the fact that I'm doing the puck drop and then singing the anthems. When we were growing up in Bozeshire, um, you know, we didn't have the money to spend as immigrants. Like, immigrant kids didn't go to Disneyland. Like, we didn't go to Jets game. We didn't go to movies. We didn't go to restaurants. Our parents were like, your mom can cook at home. The food's perfectly good at home. You can watch the game on TV. So these kinds of experiences um, weren't part of our world. It's really significant that now I think South Asians are seen as an economic power. And we are at the table. And we are represented and we are seen. You know, you've had this incredible career. You've experienced so much. But there's got to be a little girl in there somewhere who wishes her dad or her mom was there with her and could see this moment. Like, ta are you this, you've seen it all, but are you excited about this thing? And what does this thing mean, do you think? You know, um, Janet, you hit it right on the head. This is emotional for me. Like, this is not about, oh, cool, I get to do this kind of cool experience. Yes, it's cool. But for me, this is very emotional. It's emotional because my father passed away a long time ago. Uh, it's emotional because my mom will soon be 97 years old and she is unable to come now to Canada Life Centre and uh, be there for that long in such a big crowd. So she'll have to watch it at home. Um, again, as immigrants who came to this country who heard that hockey night in Canada song, um, ice hockey, you know, that was a big part of learning how to be a Canadian. Uh, to sing the national anthem, um, it's just, it is really emotional, it is moving, it is a whole other level of deep for me that most people won't realize, I tell you honestly. You're absolutely right. Uh, this is bigger, this is deeper. Like I was watching the Grammys the other night and I saw the 50 year tribute to hip hop. And I said to my kids while I was watching it, I said, wow, it's actually kind of cool because almost every, like every one of these artists was at much music. I've met almost every one of the artists on that stage. And um, a lot of them were on electric circus. So I said, you know, sometimes at odd moments, it kind of hits me that, wow, um, that's just all, it's, it's moving. But this, to be in your hometown, to sing the Canadian national anthem, uh, where a lot of my family and friends are, is full circle, and it takes you right back to who you really are and why you and your family really came here and what this country has done for you. It's mind-blowing what this country has done for me. I could never have lived the life I have lived uh, in any other country in the world. So uh, I am so happy, I am so honored, and I'm so moved that the Jets thought of me and uh, gave me this honor to sing the Canadian national anthem. It's everything. Thank you so much for joining us today. Take a Thank deep you. breath and remember everything. Thank you so much. You are looking live now at the BIPOC Lounge at the University of Winnipeg's Bullman Student Centre. That's where Black Culture Celebration Night is underway. An evening of music and performances featuring black businesses and Afro-Caribbean food. CBC's Emily Brass is there. She'll join us later live. Coming up a bit later.
For the second time in a week, the U.S. military has shot down an unknown object over American airspace. White House officials say the object posed a reasonable threat to civilian aircraft. The Pentagon made the announcement this afternoon. At the direction of the President of the United States, fighter aircraft assigned to U.S. Northern Command successfully took down a high-altitude airborne object off the northern coast of Alaska at 1.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today within U.S. sovereign airspace over U.S. territorial water. Four days after an earthquake devastated southern Turkey and northern Syria, search crews continue to find survivors. A dramatic rescue came earlier today in the Turkish city of Adiyaman. A woman was pulled alive from the rubble of a destroyed building with Canadian help. CBC's Briar Stewart has this report from the scene. They've asked us for some of the uh, assistance with our search cam because we see that now they're going across and down. It really is remarkable when you think about how many days it's been and the fact that there is a, a woman trapped in there and rescuers have made contact with her. Uh, we understand that they've given her food and water, but in terms of actually extracting her from the building, it's very difficult and, and precarious work. They brought her out uh, and there's, they're, you know, it, it's hard to see because they're actually kind of huddled over her. She's on the ground on the stretcher and um, doing some, you know, kind of basic stabilization. We know, oh, here she comes down here. Again, just a, an, inc an incredible moment. Um, this happened Monday. She's been in that building for, for days, freezing cold. She could hear rescuers, obviously, trying to get to her. And now she has been freed, the latest survivor uh, of this earthquake. Really just a, a miraculous thing to see. How does it feel to bring her out? I am happy. We are happy. You've been here now for a number of hours watching yeah. this unfold. What is it like to finally see the moment of her coming out? Oh, it, it's incredible. It, it's, it's, uh, it, it's such a rare event that you actually have somebody that can survive these conditions. And uh, the team effort here was really something else to uh, really take out a, uh, you know, the, the person who was trapped there. So something else. They grabbed her from underneath, right? Yes. Is, can you kind of take us through that, that process? From what I do know is they did try to set up all that shoring to gain access. Access, um, make it as safe as possible for them and then uh, we were assisting them with with uh, many of our tools uh, so they can get through a lot of the material there to get access to her thank you very nice much you. and good work here thank you very much meet you photo ready yeah. great, okay. job. Great, job. Great, job. great job great job so we'll see that here they want to get a photo with the canadians that have thank come to so help much. them oh, thank you. Let's get another one uh, canadian we'll get another one. that's great the CBC's Briar Stewart reporting, and that report, much of it, actually went out live on CBC News Network today. A very dramatic moment. And that was just one of many successful rescues today. A 10-day-old infant was pulled from the rubble earlier in the day, and so too was a 4-year-old boy, along with a mother and her teenage son. Today, people around the country... Nobody understands. Today, people around the country joined with those in Quebec in mourning the deaths of two children who were killed earlier this week when a bus crashed into a daycare in Laval, Quebec. Six other children were injured. A special mass was held this morning to honor the victims and their families. As you're about to hear, a local priest says the community needs time to grieve. Nobody understand what happened, nor me. But the, the thing is that we don't have to look for words or explanation. There's no explanation. It's a, it's a mystery. Suffering is a mystery. Life is a mystery. The church is packed with people today and with stuffed toys. Many traveled from outside the province to attend this mass. It comes after a candlelight vigil was held last night. The Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, attended that and said parents across the country have been holding their children a little tighter since this crash. A 51-year-old who was driving the bus is now in police custody. He is charged with two counts of first-degree murder, as well as attempted murder and aggravated assault. Canada's labour market is surpassing most economists' expectations. Statistics Canada reports a whopping boost to the economy with 150,000 
new jobs added last month. Most of those jobs are full-time ones in the wholesale, retail, healthcare, and manufacturing sectors. In addition, wages are up 4.5% over the same month last year, and the unemployment rate in Canada is holding steady at 5% nationally. In Manitoba, it went down slightly to 4.2%. You may have seen tip options increasing at your favorite restaurant, but there's another way some businesses are taking a bigger bite out of customers. They come in the form of added fees. And CBC Marketplace has found one destination in Canada that stands out for just how many places charge them and for how much. CBC's David Common explains. Canada's most popular tourist destination churns millions of dollars and at some of its hotels, restaurants and attractions, there's an extra fee tacked on next to the taxes. So small on the bill, many miss it. To me, I think it's clearly deceptive. We asked staff and servers what it was for and heard all kinds of explanations. So that's the daily mandatory tax. Not true. To be clear, these mystery fees aren't a tax. They're just an add-on for the business who then get to decide how to spend the money. The business gets to keep it. Wow, just to make money off of a tourist. That's crazy. We could pick three places. One doesn't charge it at all. One charges 10%, one charges 12%. That's insane. That's crazy. Marketplace has actually been tracking the added fees for years. In that time, the list of businesses charging them has grown, so too has the percentage charged. And frontline staff face questions. It's a total cash grab. I hate it when people ask me that. I just cringe every time. I'm totally honest about it because that's what it is. Where do you think it's going? Tax. Right. Our team found many restaurants don't warn customers about the extra fees on menus or signage until it shows up on the bill. No, I don't think that's a good idea. The city's longtime mayor says he can't stop it, but thinks provincial authorities should be scrutinizing the add-on fees. I would hope that they'd investigate to find out, first of all, if it's allowed, if it's legal, and, and the question is if it's a good idea. Days in, Milestones, Embassy Suites and Starbucks tell us those extra fees are unique to the independently operated locations in Niagara Falls. The Radisson says their 4% resort fee is on the low end going towards amenities guests can enjoy. Still, these are fees many customers don't understand. David Common, CBC News, Niagara Falls, Ontario. Now to see the full investigation, including a look into other extra fees added on to your bills, tune into Marketplace tonight. Starts at 8 right here on CBC TV or you can watch it anytime on CBC Gem. Weather specialist Fiona Odlum joins us after the break with a look at the Manitoba forecast. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
As promised, Fiona Odlum joins us once again. We're on the verge of a weekend that looks like the temperatures will be great for getting outside and getting active. Oh, yeah. It's going to be fantastic. And halfway through the show yesterday, I had this picture emailed to me. And it's my motivation for the weekend. Here it comes. It's cross-country ski trails. Look how perfectly groomed they are. Uh, Dan sent this to me from Clear Lake. If I could get there this weekend, oh, I'd be skiing on that. I'm going to do the river trail. I haven't done yet that yet this weekend. But if you go cross-country skiing this weekend, send me some pictures. I'd love to see it. We're sitting at minus 5 right now at the Forks. That's pretty comfortable skiing weather, too. Minus 7 in St. Laurent, minus 4 in Steinbeck. We have a pretty easy wind right now, wind gusts through this region, into about the 35 kilometer an hour zone. And this is the area that we're going to be giving a lot of extra attention to because we have a pretty significant low pressure system that's moving in. That's started to come through into the province already. We can see it here. It's crossed over from Saskatchewan into Manitoba. Flin Flon looks like one of the areas that's going to get significant snowfall, but then it does widen as we move across the province, and we're going to be looking for a good amount of snow with this system. But there is a little one that does start popping up here. Uh, this is over on Saturday afternoon. Now, it could bring just a light dusting of snow towards Dauphin in the afternoon. And then a second storm starts to make its way. Now, this one is interesting. It starts to get pretty widespread. And we could see a little trace snow in towards Winnipeg on Sunday. Now, with all that snow in the north, we don't have wind as a huge factor. So that's going to be good. So blowing and swirling snow shouldn't be a huge issue. What we're looking for in terms of snowfall totals, eight centimeters in towards Norway House. And then that second storm does bring in just only about two to three extra more centimeters. Towards the south, we don't see a whole lot of that action, but it is Flin Flon with 10 centimeters there that is a zone that's going to get a lot. And then it gets more with the 12 centimeters. Tonight, here we go. We're looking for temperatures to be around minus eight in Red Lake. There's a chance of some flurries in that zone for you. You saw how that, st that uh, low just moves over towards there. The wind is going to be our factor tonight. South, 30 gusting 50. We're going to see it really strong in the Dauphin area. Gusts into the 60s and 70s overnight tonight. Then you improve tomorrow. Here's all that snow that I was talking about. We're going to be seeing that as we look tomorrow, everything starts to ease up, but then the snow starts again at night. So be prepared for a break in the day and then more snow, chance of snow in Dauphin. We're going to see a great day in Winnipeg. And, you know, if you're going to be heading out and doing that cross-country skiing tomorrow in Clear Lake, you're in for a good weekend, my friend. Janet? Thanks, Fiona. Yeah. For the longest time, Carmen Acuna never wore t-shirts. She wanted to hide the scars crisscrossing her arms, but she's not afraid to talk about them now. Acuna describes herself as a recovering self-harm addict. The CBC's Creator Network brings us her story, and we do have to warn you, it contains details and photos of self-harm scars. Um, so this so was April 26. Anger feels like a psychotic rampage. The slaughtering of those innocent, blocking a path that cannot be derailed. I wish it would stop before I hurt myself. I hate the feeling in my stomach when it gets like this. I wish I could rip out my rib cage and stomp it till my legs ache. I wish the hotness in my face would travel down my throat and the back of my neck. I could snap and break at any time. This anger and emptiness lie hand in hand. I think it's getting worse now. I really don't remember what I was so upset about, which is weird, because this was so intense. I don't empathize with it anymore, which is good, because it definitely shows that I've grown. Photography is a big escape for me. I started messing around with taking pictures and portraits on my phone. The makeup part is always a big thing. It feels very transformative because I really want to portray certain things often. When I was 11, I was very lonely and I didn't have any friends really. I didn't really have anyone to talk to. I just would not speak to people, but when I would, people would just not like it. I had a lot of frustration that I couldn't really let out other than by hurting myself. 
That spiraled for sure into a really big addiction. It's really it's all I could do for comfort for a long time. I vividly remember being really upset for some reason and having to go into the bathroom of my house and had scissors. So I just sat on the toilet and just hurt myself to not think about anything else. It was, I don't know how to even describe it, but it was really unfortunate that it happened and I regret it a lot. And I wish I was able to have coped better when I was really young. It would always take away some type of emotional pain, like immediately, because I would always focus on like doing more and seeing like how bad it could get. I thought I deserved to be uncomfortable all the time. And that physical pain felt really relieving. My photography, there's always a lot of hard shadows and exposure. I wear PVC and like really shiny leather and stuff like that. It helps me portray like anger, intensity, and like sexuality. Compassion and like art and friends have really helped me heal a lot. I've been able to let out anger in different ways that are healthier for sure. It seems lonely, but it really isn't. In the bigger picture, there are so many people who feel the same way and have done the same thing. Letting it spiral is not going to help you in the long run. Like, both my arms are very different from one another now. My left arm is very scarred, and then my right is very, like, not. So I take, like, temperature differently on my left arm sometimes, which is a little scary. I never really show my arms anymore, like, ever. And when I do, I don't know, I find myself being able to do it more and not be uncomfortable or scared. I think I'm just surrounding myself with better people, and I'm able to, like, be better with myself because of it. I feel less alone, which is really nice. There's always something more to life than pain and hurting. If you or a loved one are struggling, clinics got a list of crisis support resources on its website. That's clinic with a K. It's 24 hour Seven day a week crisis line is on your screen, 204 786 8686. There's also the Manitoba Suicide Prevention and Support Line. Around the clock supports are available to you, and there's reason to live.ca as well. You can find lots of resources and numbers there. Black Culture Celebration Night is underway at the University of Winnipeg. Music, performances featuring black businesses, Afro-Caribbean food. Our Emily Brass is there and we'll check in with her for a live report after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
All right, let's hover, head over to the University of Winnipeg where Black Culture Celebration Night is in full swing. Our Emily Brass is standing by live. What's happening, Emily? Well, Janet, there's so much great energy in this room right now. A fantastic turnout for this event, first time ever held. So many people, they have to keep getting chairs. And I'm here with the organizers. We've got Abrar Abdul Mahmoud and Elsa Osuwu are here with me. Abrar, tell us what's happening here. Uh, right now, this is the Black Student Night Celebration Night. Um, we're celebrating a week of... Uh, Black History Month. We've had some performers, there's food. We have our DJ set up right now. Um, and we have students from all over Winnipeg here today enjoying us. Right now they're eating, enjoying some African and Caribbean food. Yeah. In fact, you invited people from other universities. Yes, of course. We have University of Manitoba and St. Boniface as well. Yeah. Okay. And Elsa, you're the coordinator of this room we're in, the BIPOC lounge here at the Student Center. Tell us, what is this room all about? So uh, the BIPOC lounge is actually a space, a student space. Uh, it's a room dedicated to BIPOC individuals, that's black, indigenous people of color. Just a place to relax, be themselves, um, have meetings, uh, coordinate events like this. So actually this idea was birthed in the BIPOC lounge and it's supported by the UWSA as well with funding, with support and everything in general. Why did you want to organize an event like this abroad on Black History Month? Um, as a CFS Black Student Commissioner, I knew that um, after COVID, there hasn't been any uh, activity on campus, especially for black students. And I noticed that we have a lot of international students who are new to the city. Um, so this is a good chance for them to make friends, um, get to know some of the student groups that are active on campus. Um, and I think it was a good way to get the students to get to know each other to start off the month. Yeah. And there's been some great performances, I might add. The enthusiasm's been amazing. What would you like people to take away from this? Um, just to join us celebrate Black History Month. This event was open to all. Come try African food, come try Caribbean food, and always like keep in mind that Black history is not just about the negative parts. When we think about Black history, we think about the sorrowful, we think about the depressing parts, but it's also a night of celebration. We have culture, we have heritage that we can carry on and share to the world, and all this energy, positivity, light life. Come celebrate with us and celebrate Black History Month with everyone across the world. And Abrar, are you happy with how things have turned out? You put a lot of time and energy into this. What do you think of how it's come together? I feel amazing. And earlier today, I was stressing out, like, you know, thinking of all the possible things that could go wrong. But I'm really, I'm really happy with the turnout. I love how everyone's enjoying their time. Yeah, I couldn't be happier. Wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you, Abrar and Elsa. And of course, there's going to be plenty more events all of Black History Month continuing here at University of Winnipeg. There's uh, This event is continuing until 8.30. There's another DJ coming on with Afrobeat at 7.30. So plenty to look forward to. Back to you, Janet. Thank you so much. That's our Emily Brass reporting live tonight. Still ahead, we'll have your seven-day forecast and your daily lift. Stay with us.
We have a great weekend for you in Winnipeg this weekend. Two degrees tomorrow, lots of sunshine, a little bit of a wind, a chance of some snow on Sunday, 30, 40% chance of that snow. Zero degrees on Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday, we do start seeing a little bit of snow and a cool down towards the end of the week. But if you are going north this weekend to do some snowmobiling, oh, you could not have picked a better weekend. It's snowing right now. It's going to stay snowing all weekend. And I'm no snowmobiler, Janet, but I think that's probably good conditions. Probably powder, yeah. just exactly what they want. Exactly. Customers at one of Japan's biggest department stores are wrapping themselves up in the newest fashion, apparently. <laughs> bean bags. Wearable bean bags are now a thing and are said to be the next level of relaxation. <laughs> I can't wait to see them. This is good. Here's your daily lift. <laughs> Customers love the warmth, the comfort, the flexibility of this wearable bean bag. The man who invented okay, that is handy. That was handy, the computer stand. The man who invented the wearable bean bag says the idea came from chilling at home during COVID. He calls this the next phase of nesting. And Fiona, I can tell from the way she's laughing, really likes it. The bag is proving a hit on social media for obvious reasons. <laughs> Come on. $160. <laughs> Think of it as a massage wrapped in a sweater. Listen, this is like, it's like old school weeble wobble. Like there's no way you're getting up when you fall down. It's an eggplant suit. <laughs> you look like an eggplant. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>